Our text for this afternoon is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. These are the words of God. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father." Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would drive it now into our hearts. We pray that Christ crucified would be lifted up now, and that by your spirit you would draw all men to yourself. We ask for this in Jesus' name, and amen. The message this afternoon is simple, but I hope to drive it home clearly using this text from Ephesians chapter 2. And that message is, that there is no peace apart from Christ. There is no peace apart from Christ. There is no familial peace. There is no marital peace. There is no political peace. There is not any kind of social peace apart from Christ. All other claims to peace are at best Cold War scenarios. At best, they are Cold War scenarios. All demonstrations, all protests, all riots, political solutions, resolutions, statements, signed, movements, symbols are utterly powerless to bring peace apart from Jesus Christ. This is because apart from Christ, there is guilt, there is enmity, there is resentment, fear, and hopelessness. To say that Christ is the only way to the Father is to say that Christ is the only way to peace in this world. It's necessarily the case. If he is the only way to the Father, then he is the only way for there to be peace in this world. You cannot say that Christ is the only way to God and then pretend that economics or psychology or politics or peace circles can reconcile the enmity of any people. I want to walk with you through Ephesians chapter 2 and show you how this is the case. Here, Paul picks up in chapter 2, verse 11, writing the Ephesians and reminding them that they were Gentiles, and they were at one time outside the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and therefore without God and without God, and without God and without hope. Ephesians 2, 11 through 12. It was Christ who brought the Gentiles near to God. We see that in verse 13. They were brought near by the blood of Christ. And this is because Christ is our peace, verse 14. He demonstrated that he is our peace by making Jews and Gentiles one. That's how he demonstrates that he's our peace is because he made Jew and Gentile one. And he did that by breaking down the middle wall of division between the two halves of the ancient human race. Jew and Gentile was the great division in the ancient human race and Jesus broke that down. He abolished it. He broke it down. He broke that wall down by abolishing in his flesh the enmity that existed between them. You see that in verse 15. He abolished in his flesh the enmity in order to make in himself of the two one new man, so making peace. That enmity that existed was there because of the law of commandments contained in ordinances, which included both moral and ceremonial laws. Moral laws that expose the sin and guilt of both Jew and Gentile. We see that in Romans where Paul labors that point for all men. We also have the ceremonial laws that drew lines of ethnic distinction between Jew and Gentile. 
Again, this is all in verse 15. Jesus abolished that enmity in his flesh on the cross in order that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, having slain the enmity. That's in verse 16. There is only one way for the human race to be united as one. There is only one way for the human race to be united as one because Jesus only has one body. There's only one way for the human race to be united as one, and that's because Jesus only has one body, and all the enmity and all the animosity of the human race was laid on him in the cross, and it was put to death there. The enmity and the animosity of the human race was killed when Jesus was killed. That's what it says in verse 16. So, when Christ died, the enmity died. When Christ died, the enmity died. When this gospel is preached, Jesus himself is preaching. When this gospel is preached, Jesus himself is preaching. He's preaching peace to Jews and Gentiles, those who are far away and those who are near. You see that in verse 17. He came and preached peace to you, Paul says. How did that happen? It happened when Paul came to Ephesus and preached this gospel. When Paul preached this gospel in Ephesus, Jesus himself preached peace to them. And he drew them near. He drew them near by the blood of Jesus. This peace is thoroughly Trinitarian. It is not generically deistic. It is not generically theistic. It is thoroughly Trinitarian. Without the Trinity, you cannot have this peace. And Paul says that here. The only path to this peace is through Jesus, by one spirit, to the Father. That's the, only, that's, that's the only peace there is. It's the peace that's through Jesus, and Jesus takes us to the Father by one Spirit. Christians commonly quote John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christians commonly quote that, but what many falsely assume is that when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, they wrongly assume that the way that Jesus is talking about is merely the way to heaven. Many Christians wrongly assume that the way that Jesus is talking about there is merely the way to heaven. It is absolutely true that no one goes to heaven apart from Christ. But what Jesus says there is that there is no other way to the Father. That, that's what he actually says. He says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, we definitely do go to heaven. When, when we go to heaven, we go to the Father, and we go to the Father through Christ. But we also go to the Father for all that we need. We go to the Father for food and clothing. Jesus teaches this in Matthew 7, verse 11. And so if we must go to the Father for food and clothing, how much more should we go to the Father for healing and reconciliation of our families, for healing and reconciliation in our churches, for healing and reconciliation in our cities, for healing and reconciliation in our nation? If we must ask the Father for these things, then we must ask the Father for peace. Jesus also taught us, taught us to ask the Father for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6, 10. So, if we go on in the Lord's Prayer to also confess that his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, then we are confessing that he is the only one who has the power to bring peace. And we're also confessing that when this peace is accomplished, it will be for his glory alone. When Christ's peace comes, when the peace of the Father comes, no one will credit the riots. No one will credit the protests or the demonstrations or some bill that got passed. No, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All the glory will go to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's how it will happen. No one will say, well, it's a good thing we rioted. It's a good thing we protested. It's a good thing we signed that. No, everyone will fall on their knees and say, this peace is from Christ alone. Now, God made the world in such a way, and this is included here and assumed in this text, God made the world in such a way that all human beings are related to one another in and through their relationship to God. Okay? What Paul is saying here in Ephesians 2 
is that all human beings are related in and through their relationship to God. In other words, there's no way of relating to another human being or another group of human beings that in any way, that is in some way unrelated to the God in, whom, in whose image they're made. There's, there's absolutely no way to relate to another human being or another group of human beings in some way that's unrelated to the God whose image they bear. This is because we all live and move and have our being in him. We all live and move and have our being in God. This is seen in Acts 17, 28. To be made in God's image is to live and move and have your being in God. Think of it like this. Imagine a, a giant cosmic 3D pyramid or, or cone, if you prefer, with God at the very top. The only way for two or more human beings in this world to move closer together is for them to move up and closer to God. And so all, the whole human race is here on this, on this gigantic 3D pyramid or cone. The whole human race is there. The only way for two human beings or two groups of human beings to actually get any closer together, there's no way through. The only way is up. The only way to get for two human beings to get closer to one another is for them to draw closer to God. That's the only way. There's no other way. It is utterly impossible and futile to try anything else. The only way to move cl closer to another person is to move closer to the Father. And the only way to move closer to the Father is through Christ and by His Spirit. Apart from Christ, you cannot have peace and you cannot make peace. In our current cultural, political moment, all promises of peace are inherently competing alternatives to Christ. They're all competing alternatives to Christ. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Trumpism, Globalism, Antifa, Socialism, Libertarianism, Anarchism, Conservatism, whatever. Whatever. If it doesn't have Christ at the center, it's offering you another Christ. If Christ is not there displayed, Him crucified, if his peace is not being offered, it's another Christ. It's another offer of peace. Don't misunderstand me. Some of these options that I just read off are worse than others. Some of them make, uh, make for a, a tactically better or worse situation momentarily. But make no mistake. Anything without Christ at the center, without Christ crucified at the center as its overarching principle is a competing gospel. It's a competing religion, and it cannot bring peace. There is no peace apart from Christ. All these other options can do is rearrange the animosity. That's the best they can do. They can rearrange the enmity. They can rearrange the rage. They can rearrange the hatred. This is because the further you get away from Christ, the further you get away from other people. So again, imagine the pyramid. Imagine that cone. It's either closer to the Father through Christ, and therefore closer to one another. Or, as you turn away from the Father, as you turn away from Christ, what happens? Inescapably, you get further away from other people. If you move away from Christ, you are, by definition, moving away, further away from other people. And the further you move away from Christ, who alone heals our animosity and our enmity, the more you will have of it. Do you see? You move away from Christ, and what happens? He is the one who takes away our animosity. He's the one who takes away our enmity. He's the only one who can do that. You move away from him, and what do you have? More of it. Not less of it. More of it. And if you have more of it, you're further apart. You're further away. There's more division. There's more animosity. To say that you might move closer to other people apart from Christ is to say that you will have some other solution to all that enmity. To say that you will move closer to other people, we will make peace, we will somehow work this out, we will figure this out. If Christ is not there at the center, you're saying you're going to find some other savior. You're claiming another cross, another Christ, another gospel. But there is no other Christ. There is no other Christ. There is no other name under heaven whereby men may be saved. All of this is why C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce, he pictured hell as people constantly quarreling and bickering and fighting and moving farther and farther apart, 
thousands and millions of light years away from one another toward an utter and absolute isolation. That's hell. People moving further and further apart because the further and further you get from God, just, just extrapolate that pyramid out. The further you get from God, the further you get away from one another. The only way back toward other people is back toward Christ. Even in situations where the others don't seem interested in making peace, the only way for you to get as close as you can to that peace is for you to move toward the Father through the Son by his Spirit. And if you're drawing near to the Father in Christ, then you are getting as near as possible to anyone you might be at odds with. So the Bible teaches that there's a fundamental difference between keeping peace and making peace. The Bible teaches that there's a fundamental difference between keeping peace and making peace. The Bible teaches that you cannot make peace unless God has first given the gift of his peace, which Christians are then commanded to keep. This is why a little later, Paul urges the Ephesians in chapter 4. He says that they ought there to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's Ephesians 4, 3. So Christian peacemaking is essentially receiving the gift of God's peace and then applying it to our lives. That's Christian peacemaking. It's receiving the gift of God's peace and then applying it to our lives and all of our lives. But you cannot apply what you don't have. You cannot apply what you don't have. You cannot give what you have not first received. Fallen, sinful man cannot make peace. Fallen, sinful man cannot make peace. If fallen, sinful man could make peace, then we don't need Jesus. If fallen, sinful man could make peace, we don't need Christ. We don't need his cross. We don't need his gospel. If there is something we could do to fix these problems in our families, in our churches, in our cities, in our nation, if there was something we could do, then we wouldn't need Jesus. If we could reconcile warring nations, ethnic strife, family feuds, cold war marriages, or the deep wounds of separated parents and children, then we wouldn't need Christ. But the message of the Bible is that man cannot make peace. We can't make peace. We are hopelessly hateful and malicious and resentful and defensive and bitter. And so this is why Christ came. He came to establish peace on earth. That's what the angels sang. That's what they sang to the shepherds when Christ was born. Christ was born for this. That's the message. He came to bring peace. And, and what do we do? We scurry around coming up with our own ideas, our own plans. Here, sign this. Come here, stand here, hold this sign. Do this, post this. Christ came to bring peace. So there's only way to peace, and that is by believing and receiving the peace that Jesus accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago. This is the peace that just is. It's a peace that just is. It was accomplished and it is finished. There's nothing you can add to it. God doesn't need our help with it. We, our job is to just receive it and believe it and to get out of the way. We receive it, we believe it. It just is. There's nothing we can do to help with that peace. This is clearly taught here in Ephesians chapter 2. What does it say? Verse 15. What did he do? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. And came and preached peace to you who are far off and to them who are near. This is, this is how God brings his peace. He abolished in his flesh the enmity between God and man and man and man. Why? So that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. Notice, who's the subject of those sentences? God is. Jesus is the subject. He is the actor. He is the one who abolishes in his flesh. He is the one who reconciles both unto God in one body. He is the one who kills the enmity. It's something that God does. We're not anywhere in there. 
Well, the only thing we are in there, are we are the, we're the disparate pieces. We're the pieces that he puts together. We're the broken people he's smashing together. He is the one, that, we're the, just the ones that are being healed. He is the actor. We're the ones being acted upon. How did he make this peace? How does Christ make this peace? Christ makes this peace by abolishing the enemy, by destroying the enemy. He, he destroyed it. He abolished it. He put it to death. Therefore, he has already reconciled the raging enmities of man. They're dead. This is the message of the cross. Your enmity is dead. Christ killed it. It died when he died. He has already reconciled us in one body to God. The enmity died and was completely finished when Jesus cried out, it is finished and died. The enmity is dead. The enmity is dead. This is why all human attempts to destroy enmity ourselves are worthless and useless and worse than useless. The only Christian path to peace begins with the announcement that the enmity and animosity is already dead. It's already dead. It died on the cross with Christ and it was buried with him in the tomb. And when Christ rose from the dead, it was gone. It did not come back from the dead. The enmity did not come back from the dead with Jesus. It's gone. You ever notice when, when Jesus comes back from the dead, what is the thing he keeps saying over and over again? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. It's almost like he's trying to make a point. It's almost like he's saying the enmity is gone because he is. There's no more enmity. All he has in his mouth, the only thing he can say is peace. Peace be with you. The enmity was gone. The enmity was dead. And so all he had to say was peace. And that message is the message that must be believed and received in order for there to be peace anywhere in this world. If you don't believe that message, if you won't receive that message, or if you think you need to add something to that message, you are insisting on carrying around a maggot-infested body of enmity around with you. That's what you're insisting on. This is because the enmity really is dead. It, it is dead. He killed it. Christ really did kill it, and now people try to carry it around. And it's infested with maggots, and it's disgusting, and it's no wonder no one really likes being around you. So if we are in Christ, then we are already uni united, we are already unified, and we already have peace with God and one another. This is the message of the cross. You already are united. We already are united. We already have peace with God and all his people. This is why you can meet believers. You've probably had this experience before. You go to church, some, some church you've never been to on the other side of the country, or maybe on the other side of the world, and you meet believers in every place of the world, and you feel like you're meeting family, because you are. Christ is our peace. He is our peace. We're not trying to make him our peace. We're not trying to get him to be our peace. He is our peace. Our job is to simply receive that. And all that we labor at is to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is also why if you're not in Christ, or if the one you're laboring to be at peace with is not in Christ, you cannot be at peace. You cannot have peace without Christ. There can be no true peace between light and darkness. You can't make peace there. You can't make peace between righteousness and unrighteousness. There's no peace between Christ and Belial. There, th what agreement does God have with Baal? So all the demonstrations, all the riots, all the protests, all the political power plays are nothing if the peace of Christ is not at the center, if the peace of Christ is not the thing being proclaimed, if the peace of Christ is not the overarching principle driving it all, at best, all they're doing is merely rearranging the enmity. Now, the obvious question after all of this is, so then, why are there riots and violence in our streets? You, pre, okay, preacher, you just said Christ accomplished it, the enmity's dead. So, so why the violence? Why the riots? Why, why the murder? Why the violence? Why is there so much animosity in our land, so much division in the church, so much brokenness in our families? If Christ accomplished our peace and the enmity is dead, why are we so divided? But if you've been listening, then you know the answer. Because we have turned away from Christ. How could we not be divided? 
How can we not meet each other's throats? We turned away from Christ. We turned away from our peace. He is there. He has established peace. He has accomplished peace. But what have we done? We've rejected it. We've rejected the only source of peace. How could there not be violence in our streets? How could there not be buildings burning? How could there not be families torn apart? How could there not be murder and bloodshed? We turned away from the only source of peace. The further you move away from Christ, the further you get from those around you. The further you get away from Christ, the more animosity and enmity you get. There is no other way. There's no other way. There is only one way to the Father. It's through Christ. It's through his peace. There's no other way to draw near to someone else. You can't make it happen. It's like trying to force you know, the, the ends of the magnets together, and you try to make them go together. They don't go together. They only go together in Christ. They only move together in Christ. Christ is our peace. Christ is the only way to draw near to God, and therefore he is the only way to draw near to anyone who bears God's image. There is no peace apart from Christ. That's what it says. There's no peace apart from Christ. And, what, and what, what's the problem? The problem is there are, there are unbelievers who are outside of Christ, and so, of course, they don't have that peace. But the greater problem, the more insidious problem, is that we have millions of Christians in this land who name the name of Christ, who don't believe that Christ is their peace. They don't have Christ as their peace. Their families are a wreck. Their businesses are a wreck. They're full of bitterness. They're full of anger. And they're trying to cope with other things. They're trying to cover the pain. They're trying to cover the brokenness. They're trying to make up for it. That's the real shame. The real shame is we have a country full of millions of Christians who profess to know Christ, who do not know Christ, who is our only peace. We have turned away from Christ. We have turned away from our peace. The Christian church has. We say his name and we, our hearts are far from him. And, we, and, the, the, and it's obvious that our hearts are far from him because we are far from him. Because there's no peace. We have no peace. This current cultural moment is the death throes of all of our apostasy, all our Darwinian relativism. The riots and angry demonstrations are merely large collections of people hauling around dead bodies full of maggots, full of enmity and animosity, bitterness, guilt, and fear. That's what you're seeing in the streets. That's what you're seeing in your feeds. That's what you're seeing in the evening news. It's just people hauling around dead bodies full of maggots, of enmity and animosity. That's what it is. And for many, they know the whole thing smells like death. The whole thing smells like death. And this is why it's getting so violent. Despair and guilt and fear mixed together to make a terrible social cocktail. But the message of the cross is for this. The message of the cross is for this. It smells like death because it is death. It's death. But Christ is our peace. He abolished the enmity in his flesh. He has made peace in his body. The enmity is dead. It's dead. Drop it. Let it go. It's, it's nothing. You're, you're hauling around this dead body of enmity and hatred and rage and bitterness against your parents, against your spouse, against your kids, against your boss, your old boss, your pastor, your people, your elders. Right? That's what you're hauling around. You're hauling around a dead body full of maggots. That's what it is. It's dead. Christ died in order that it might die. The enmity is dead. Let it go. It is this proclamation that God is determined to use to bring about peace in this world. Right? Remember this. This is what Paul himself says, that Christ himself came and preached peace to the Ephesians. Christ himself comes and he proclaims peace to all nations. He preaches peace to all the families of the earth, to all the businesses of the earth, to all the cities of the earth. To every square inch of this earth, Christ himself comes, and he comes in the person of preachers. And what do preachers do? What they do is they proclaim Christ crucified, which is the death of all enmity. It's the death of all animosity. It's the death of it all, being abolished and killed on his cross. You remember the story in Numbers, where Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole. He lifted it up on the pole, and everyone who looked at the dead serpent was healed. We are snake bit. Our nation, our land, our people, we are all full of that poison, the poison of accusation, the poison of animosity, the poison of enmity. And the only solution, there's no economic solution, there's no mob solution, there's no protest solution, there's no political solution, there's no psychological solution. The only solution is seeing Christ crucified. 
It's seeing the death of your enmity in Christ. It's seeing him lifted up and on the cross and there seeing your death dying, seeing your poison dying. And there God, by his spirit, mercifully draws it out and he heals. That's what we need. We need preachers of the gospel who will go into every square inch of this world and proclaim in the name of Jesus the peace of his cross because there's no other peace. There is no other peace except for Christ. In him, all enmity is dead. All animosity is dead. It is finished because Christ died. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.